All right. I think uh, it's about time to to start. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Elizabeth McAllister, who uh, is visiting us from Wesleyan University uh, and is going to talk to us today. The title of your talk is American Evangelical Spiritual Warfare and Vodou in Haiti. Great. Um, and sorry, I don't have uh, my my notes in front of me. I was just uh, had a technological snafu with my class that's running uh, parallel with this talk right now. Um, long story. I'm talking about that afterwards. Um, <coughs> so uh, Professor McAllister uh, got her PhD from uh, Yale University in American Studies in 1995. Uh, she's a professor of religion, uh, also American Studies and African Studies at, um, at Wesleyan University. Uh, she's the author of two fantastic books. Um, one of them is Ra Ra uh, Power. Voodoo Power and Performance in Haiti. Voodoo Power and Performance in Haiti. Uh, Are you sure Ra Ra Power? No, no, it is. Yeah. Ra Ra, 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 Ra Colon. Colon. Got it. Yeah. And another uh, <laughs> an, edited, uh, an edited volume on religion, nation, nation and race in the Americas. Uh, she is, um, well, we. We're, we're trying to decide whether she should be named Voodoo Queen of, of Religious Studies, uh, but she certainly has been, uh, for me, uh, an important mentor in some of the projects that, uh, that I'm working on. I really appreciate that she's here uh, to talk with, with us today. Um, so since we're running a little bit late, I'm, I'm just gonna cut my remarks short and turn it over to, to Liza. Thank you so much. Well, can everyone hear me if I speak this way? Great. Well, thanks to Professor Selka and the Department of Religion for having me. It's already been a treat. Um, so I got an email this morning asking me to pray that, quote, train killers will be sent out to take the land, atmosphere, and dominion over all works of the evil one, and that our intercessory team will function in prophetic revelation at all times. That's the kind of email I get, I don't know, <laughs> you get. I was trained last fall at a spiritual warfare boot camp. And the book I'm writing now is about how some evangelical Protestants are rewriting history, especially national histories, as an expression of an evangelical theolo theo theology known as spiritual warfare. It's relatively new. And I'm looking at the way they're rewriting US history and Haitian history. So I'm going to take you through the basics of spiritual warfare thought, how it works in training and in mission work, and particularly in terms of Haiti, and if there's time, which I don't think there will be, how um, the voodoo sector is responding. So next slide. Thank you, Professor Dirksen. Um, one of the aims of the book is to expand the literature on the militarization of everyday life to argue that contemporary military metaphors and practices have become a generative force animating the sphere of Christian prayer. So we don't ordinarily think of militarism and Christian prayer, or maybe we do, but I'm forced to think of those things very closely. Next slide. The wars of the 20th century and the corresponding processes of mil militarization have affected almost every aspect of social life around the globe. And uh, Christian prayer and missions are no exception. And you can even get a charm bracelet um, putting on the full armor of God. As Catherine Lutz argues, the cap quote, the capillaries of militarization have fed and molded social institutions seemingly little connected to battle, end quote. So the, this is the breastplate of righteousness and the sword of the spirit from the book of Ephesians. What is the spiritual warfare movement? Like Pentecostals, and it it's overlaps with Pentecostals, its members refer to themselves as spirit-filled and understand that through the Holy Spirit, they're not only saved from sin, but they can receive the gifts or the charismata of healing, prophecy, and speaking in tongues. They avoid alcohol, drugs, profanity, unchristian, that is, unmarried sex, homosexuality, gambling. All of these things are potentially against God and are usually sent by the devil to tempt people into sin. So next slide. Speaking of the devil, um, the world is mapped into a duality, very stark duality, that which is Christian and that which is demonic. The world is mapped into churched and unchurched 
spaces, places, and territories. And territory is not just a geographical term. It's, first of all, a juridico-political one. It refers to an area controlled by a certain kind of power. So for these evangelicals, territories can be ruled by, quote, principalities and powers, which is the phrase from Ephesians uh, in the Bible, invested, so territories can be invested with spiritual energies. God has a plan for some nations, for specific land, and some land is more filled with the Holy Spirit than others. This is a worldwide, uh, oh, sorry, a world view that is shared, lest you think it's an extreme bunch of wackos, which it may or may not be, it's also shared by people in positions of authority, such as Sarah Palin, Michelle Bachman, Governor Rick Perry, and General William Boykin of the Pentagon. This became news several years ago in terms of Boykin. So Professor Dirksen's gonna try to get this clip to play of Boykin um, and his views of spiritual warfare. General William Boykin, a much decorated veteran of special operations, has long been one of this country's secret warriors. Now he has a senior job in the Pentagon working to track down terrorists. He is also an evangelical Christian who believes God intervenes in the affairs of man, specifically that God put George Bush in the White House and that the war against terror is a war against Satan himself. It's not a tunnel in one. It's not what you can see. The enemy in the spiritual realm. Ten years ago, Boykin was the commander of the Delta Force in Somalia when 18 American soldiers were killed in a firefight in the streets of Mogadishu. He shows church groups photos he took of Mogadishu with black slashes in the sky, which he says did not come from any defect in the camera or film. Well, you understand it or not, it was a demonic spirit over the city of Mogadishu. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not a fake. That's not a that's not a fake, that's a demonic spirit over the city of Mogadishu. So next slide. General Boykin is speaking in the vocabulary of the spiritual mapping and spiritual warfare movement. The movement has mapped the entire globe using GIS technology. American evangelicals have produced a global map, not only of what they call people groups, but also of territories. They extend what Michael Shapiro in American Studies calls moral geographies, the way certain territories are inflected with kind of moral valence in po popular thought, and they map space into theological geographies. According to this evangelical movement, quote, the church is presently faced with a substantial challenge to its continued expansion, demonic entrenchment, end quote. Evangelical missionaries have mapped the globe into Christian reached and unreached territories, and they've concluded that, quote, successful church planting in the Pacific, Africa, and Latin America has largely reduced the world's prime, I love this term, evangelistic real estate into a swath of territory from 10 degrees to 40 degree north latitude, running through Northern Africa and Asia, known as the 1040 window. Um, just out of curiosity, has anybody heard of the 1040 window before? Okay, all right, a couple people. And next slide. The reason that Christianity cr cannot grow in these places is that their ancient peoples transacted pacts with unchristian powers, usually territorial spirits and deities associated with rocks, trees, and rivers. And we can note that the 1040 window happens to be the Islamic world, um, India, and it actually, they tend to stop it before it runs into the European spaces that would be 10, 1040 window. So the 1040 window is very much about the homes of Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, um, and that's because of these ancient pacts with ancestral spirits. Or in our vocabulary in religious studies, the reason Christianity cannot grow is that indigenous religious forces are still occupying the land, or at least indigenous forces would be uh, indigeneity would be the religious studies uh, take. In addition to native religions, other demonic forms for the Christians include f Freemasonry, New Age practices, paganism, astrology, yoga, and of course the sins of pornography, homosexuality, abortion, and the places that produce them. The answer to these constant demonic attacks is to train in spiritual warfare techniques. Something I had the privilege to do last October when I enrolled in a spiritual warfare boot camp. So here's a little bit of ethnographic description. 
It was before sunrise, and we 15 recruits were assembled in five rows in an open field in the Oklahoma countryside. We had run quickly from pre-dawn prayer, prayer group into our assigned formation before the drill sergeant could blow his whistle. We recruits were Anglo, Cherokee, Chickasaw, Navajo, Oneida, and Lakota Sioux. The officers were all Native American Vietnam veterans, and they were giving us a crash course in military discipline. We wore matching uniforms of boot camp t-shirt and black cadets beret. One by one, we were inspected or barked a question. What is general order number four? The correct answers were all from the Bible. I will report accurately by the spirit of truth all enemy formations. John 16, 13. Sir! Eleven general orders had been assigned for exact memorization, and we were being tested. What is gen Again, barked the loud question. What is general order number five? I will stand at my post until we all come into the unity of the faith. Ephesians 4, 13. Sir! See, I'm still good at it. <laughs> Soon we were joined by the three prayer warriors who had been chosen to walk the perimeter of the land looking for signs of enemy activity. Such signs required discernment, and we warriors were supposed to become attuned to spiritual spirit supernatural signs peeking out from the natural world. All of this military discipline, I learned how to salute, I learned how to do military marching, about face, forward march, right hand, left hand, um, now I'm forgetting what the command would be. Um, all of this military discipline Taken was taken straight from their experience as soldiers in Vietnam, and it was to teach us the principles of honor and authority, which would become the foundation for our lives as victorious prayer warriors. As the week went by, I realized that the tough military discipline the officers were subjecting us to was a veneer, covering a deep sense of Christian love and affectionate caring. Formal commands gave way to moments of emotional bonding in prayer on several occasions. The leaders explained that they were disciplining us as a loving gift so that we would be strong enough to follow the protocols, focus, and lines of command that spiritual warfare required. Everyone who comes into the kingdom of God comes into spiritual warfare whether they like it or not, said the leading apostle on the first night of boot camp. For the next week, we, the speakers filled out the underlying narrative of Satan's war against God. What unfolded was a legalistic account, beginning with the idea that God gave earthly dominion to Adam and Eve in Genesis, and when Satan's temptation of Eve in Genesis, she eats the apple, we remember this, uh, leads to the fall of man, legal authority extends to Satan and explains why life on earth is fraught with suffering. They say legally Satan gained the right to be prince of this world, the phrase from John 12, 31. And he commands an army of demons who maintain strongholds throughout, uh, which are now geographic and spiritual bases of demonic power throughout the world. After Christ was crucified in payments for the sin of all humankind, Satan was dispossessed of his dominion on earth, but his strongholds did not melt away. And instead, Satan and his demonic army hold on to what power they have through social vice and sin, perpetrating. So if we commit violence, if we worship idols, do sexual iniquity, uh, if we're in poverty, addiction, abortion, all of those sins, those sins function as an invitation for Satan's demons to enter and begin what they call legal operations, what the spiritual warriors call legal operations. So, and interestingly, for our purposes, looking at Haiti, related causes for demonic territorial spirits might include collective trauma, like a massacre, being enslaved, where in their desperation, groups had to enter into pacts with demons to resolve their immediate trauma. Said one warrior, it is through the placement of these welcome mats then, these ancient welcome mats, that demonic territorial strongholds are established. So they believe that something called ancestral sin uh, still affects present populations. And in these cases, the demons have a legal right to stay. So both the trauma of native genocide and displacement, the trauma of African slavery, 
and their peoples reaching for traditional deities for help continues to make Native and Haitian people and black people throughout the world who were enslaved more vulnerable to demonic attack. Okay, next slide. Spiritual warfare, and I, did, I was not trained in handling arms. There was uh, very little, there was absolutely no physical, the physical dimension to the warfare was about fasting and the ordeal of, the, of supplication to biblical principles. Um, it consists of, spiritual warfare consists of round the clock intercessory prayer and um, spiritual warriors pray and fast, sometimes moving out into space and circling demonic strongholds. They will pour anointing oils into the ground um, or doing other things as directed by their assignment from the Holy Spirit because people tend to be directed directly from the Holy Spirit about what the mission is and what the particulars are of the mission. Now, like critical academic thought, which strives to speak about a subject outside its own terms, mm -hmm. right, critical thought, Spiritual mapping is, to quote them, an attempt to see territory as it really is, not as it appears to be. I love that, because we have that in common. Spiritual discerners are not looking, as social scientists are, for unseen social forces of power or social structures of domination. Rather, the unseen forces relevant to the, this Christianity are the spiritual manifestations of good or evil. So now in Haiti, what are the evangelicals fighting? They're fighting the traditional African-based religion called, that gets called Vodou. Um, we can go one slide. And what is Vodou? Oh, one more slide. What is Vodou? Um, this is not the Christian version, but the anthropological version. And I'm going to give you the tiniest possible gloss of what is Vodou. Briefly, the system posits a remote creator god under whom exist a pantheon of spirits called Lua, which are inherited through family lines. Some spirits live in trees and in rivers, in cemeteries, or at the crossroads. Most urban priests and priestesses work closely with a type of ancestor spirit who, um, who appears to them through spirit possession, dreams, or omens. And they are thought, the spirits are thought to afflict and protect family members. So the spirit might make you sick if it wants something, and then if you give that thing to the spirit, it makes you well and it protects you and gives you power and uh, sort of protective covering. And here's a slide of me at a blue service. Next slide. If it comes up there, looking really nerdy. Um, <laughs> now, historically, Catholicism has creolized with Vodou into what Haitians call le mélange. Right, so it's a sort of syncretized uh, understanding. Mainline Protestants tended to understand Vodou as superstition, a faulty belief. You know, once people convert to Jesus, they'll get rid of their superstition, they'll be modern. Evangelicals, though, not mainline, but evangelical Protestants have engaged with the spirit entities of Vodou as real adversaries populating the spiritual plane. For Pentecostals in particular, Vodou is as real as Christ himself, and the Vodou spirits are the foot, foot soldiers of Satan. Say that three times back. Only the Holy Spirit can do battle with the demonic spirits and conquer evil, and Christian warriors are using the name of the Holy Spirit to cast out these demons. Haiti's poverty, political turmoil, and structural disadvantage with regard to the United States are held up as proof of contracts that are being constantly renewed with demonic voodoo spirits. So in Haiti, um, we can go to the next slide, both the military and voodoo are a big part of Haiti's national pride. So the, here the story gets complicated. It's complicated by the militarization of uh, everyday life in the US, but also in Haiti, where the military has a different history than it does in the US, and this is a painting of a famous um, gathering of enslaved Africans who are enslaved in the colonial period, and at this gathering, they decide they're going to they're going to basically rebel. They're going to they're going to turn up, and they uh, they make it. It's a political and religious service, and it's called Bois Caima. So this is in all the Haitian national national history books that the Revolutionary War was launched just a few weeks um, after this religious ceremony at which, and this is in 1791, 
an African slave named Bukman sacrificed a pig. You can kind of see the pig. Can you see the pig on the ground? Mm -hmm. um, and um, African ancestral spirits descend to possess the bodies of the participants, encouraging them and fortifying them for the upcoming battle, which they go on to win. Despite deep ambivalence on the part of intellectuals, Catholics, and the money classes, Vodou in Haiti has always been linked with militarism, the War of Independence, and through it, the pride of national sovereignty. They're the first uh, slave revolution to win freedom for a country. And here's the Haitian army in 1899, um, which I found in the archive. Beginning in the highly militarized atmosphere of colonial Saint-Domingue, the cosmology that it evolved within Vodou is also highly militarized. So the spirits often are seen as having ranks in the military. Uh, Ogun will be a general. Loko is a minister of affairs. And you know every, the spirits have ranks themselves. So in some ways, <coughs> Vodou or African forces, militarism, emancipation, and pride are all linked together with Haitian uh, nationalism as parts of Haitian nationalism. So and here's Toussaint Louverture, one of the most famous uh, Haitian uh, revolutionaries. So for a national culture that is based, however ambivalently, on ideas of an African past and pride in an Afro-Creole spiritual system and spiritual re and, and sorry revolutionary war of independence, what does it mean to be told and to accept that one's national culture is evil? Because that's the evangelical position. What happens to the evangelical story when it is told to Haitians and when they take up the story as their own? Um, so I've been trying to figure out this question for a number of years. Why do they take it up? What happens to the story? Um, you can do one more slide. In, um, in a paradoxical sort of a way, spiritual warfare evangelicals, both American and Haitian, have come to see Haiti as having been enslaved by Satan just at the same time that it was freed from slavery through the revolution in 1804. So it starts in 1791. By 1804, they declare their independence. Now, Pat Robertson, our very good friend on uh, his television, uh, Christian television broadcasting network, caused a small media storm when he repeated this on the network two days after the earthquake in 2010. He said, quote, and I won't play it because I can just read it, uh, they got together and swore a pact to the devil. They said, we will serve you if you get us free from the prince, uh, the prince of this world, Satan. True story, he says. What most, and everybody went crazy as they should have and said, you know, Pat Robertson, this is obscene, how can you say this? But this was not his idea. He was parroting spiritual warfare theology about Haiti. Um, and it's true that Haitian and American spiritual warfare evangelicals are in a minority, but they're a very vocal minority that um, extends throughout the Haitian social sphere, certainly the diaspora and the, and, and the country itself. So they, they're um, starting to form, the evangelicals are starting to rewrite history and form new identities. And like uh, any important idea, the narrative is taken up, sometimes it's accepted, sometimes it's rejected, and um, sometimes people find middle grounds about what it means. So let me back up for a minute and talk about the American involvement. If you can go forward to a conference slide. There we go. Since the 1990s, Haitian spiritual warriors have taken workshops led by pastors from the United States who schooled Haitians in the Pentecostal practices of, quote, spiritual I'm uh, sorry, of spiritual warfare. They learned the techniques of, quote, putting on full armor, pulling down strongholds, coming under the blood, and taking Jericho marches. In groups of ritual prayer and fasting, they would exercise local sites in the countryside, um, often family, spirits, uh, cemeteries, or um, national sites that were linked to voodoo. They interpreted scripture literally in terms of national territory. And they preached that, quote, we believe that the Lord really does want his people to possess the land. So there's a lot of rhetoric of possessing the land. So this um, Bwakaima voodoo ceremony, they had a completely new interpretation of. 
they blamed, it starts out with the Catholic Church being the bad guys. Um, so they get as far as to say, yes, the Catholic Church was bad and it colluded with the slave trade, which was also bad, it was sinful. Um, and they say the Catholic Church blessed the slave market and they racialized evil in terms of African skin. They got, got a little anti-racist piece of their logic, which, which we might agree with. The French sin of slavery opened the door for Africans to turn to Satan as their divine protector. Now, this is where it goes a little off the rails. In invoking African and Creole spirits to possess the religious leaders who had attended, um, and in sacrificing the pig especially, Buchmann had made a blood pact with the devil and dedicated Haiti to serve the devil. So this is what Pat Robertson was talking about. And the reason they say this is that in the Ten Commandments, God says, thou shalt not worship other gods before me. And so that means Haiti, um, it's not that God punished Haiti, but it's that God lifted his veil of protection from Haiti. And therefore, four generations of judgment were allowed to, uh, to it's not exactly God's curse, but it's God's judgment. And that explained four generations, they've worked it all out numerologically, that explains the past 200 years of misery since independence. So now we'll go to the bicentennial. So 200 years after the Haitian Independence War, the bicentennial is about to happen. Here's one of Haiti's famous buses called a tap tap with white Jesus painted on the back. Um, surely an evangelical owns this tap tap. And white Jesus is a whole other story, whole other paper, which I just published actually in the Journal of African Religion. Um, but the, the political and economic violence starts to escalate around the bicentennial for reasons that are not really to do with this religious situation. And you can go one more over. Oh, one more over than that. Okay. Um, a group of white American evangelicals. So this slide symbolizes like escalating political violence. A group of white evangelicals um, from America analyzed the situation as a spiritual one. They produced a spectacular revival crusade in the Haitian capital, which was to break the blood pact that Buchmann had made with the devil. And they produced a spectacle and accompanying video that re-narrates the history of Haiti and casts the present as a dramatic turning point. So we're going to play a little piece of, I, it's a longer video that I sli spliced together. Behind me is the Haiti White House. This is uh, Independence Day, a very, very important date in the nation of Haiti's history. January the 1st, 2004, is the 200th anniversary of the country of Haiti. In 200 years of bondage, happened because they ate at the table of Jesus.
spoke quietly into my heart. Go to Haiti. I have a ministry for you there. It was not the end. It was only the beginning of the greatest story of the greatest life that's ever been told. There's nothing more powerful than the cross of Christ. And so, uh, by the grace of God, I will come in as an old woman cross builder, a woodcutter. And my job on this uh, tragic but faithful day is to build a 14 foot cross for the most extraordinary man who ever lived and died. And after I build the cross, then I will take the role play of Jesus under the cross and talk about the last words of Christ on Calvary and the impact those words have on our relationship with Christ today. And eventually challenge the men and women in the audience to uh, give their whole heart and their whole soul away uh, to serve and follow Jesus Christ. We have about nine good priests who accepted Christ as their own personal Savior during this week. In 1804, this country was dedicated to the devil. The slaves under the leadership of a witch doctor by the name of Volkmann sacrificed a pig and entered into a satanic blood cult to dedicate the country, a baby, to the devil if they would be given their freedom from the fray. And so tonight on January the 3rd, we are proclaiming liberty to Haiti in the name of the Father. one more. So there's a lot to be said about that clip and how the soundscape is manipulated and how the race of the Americans is working as representing Jesus. There's so much to unpack. But um, one of the things that I've been trying to figure out along those lines, it, oh, actually, see if you can go, yeah, is what's the appeal uh, of this movement for as I, as I started out asking, and how to make sense of these competing narratives. Um, and to me, where I go in my writing is, I, I, mean, I think the, the obvious, um, it's clear that, that there's an American uh, po potentially neo-colonial impulse at work here. It's clear that the race piece of this is very um, much an echo of the past. But what I'm interested in is trying to find the things that make it appealing for Haitians and the kind of ironies that I'm finding in the narrative that help explain its appeal. So one of them is that, um, one irony is that about the fact that the original Wakai Ma story, the pig sacrifice, has historically been put to use in anti-colonial and then decolonizing movements in Haiti. And people to this day are constantly having conferences about it and referring to it. And it's a precious moment. It's the subject of tons of artwork. But the evangelicals construct an anti-colonialist narrative when they say that Satan is the colonial power that must be overthrown. And so if we look closely at the blood pact story as an anti-colonialist narrative, we may gain insight into why some Haitians would adopt that story so much to heart in taking on the rhetorical and ritual work of myth-making to break the blood pact and win Haiti for Jesus, 
any citizen in that country or in this country can stand in the stream of history and act on behalf of the entire nation in this great cosmic battle between good and evil. There's another twist that I find really interesting. Um, according to most uh, spiritual warfare leaders, mission, uh, missionaries and evangelists will be most effective working legally under the authority of God in the territory where they and their ancestors have lived the longest. So, and this is because of a thing in Acts where God, um, God assigns of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on, on all the face of the earth and the bounds of their habitation. So they have this idea that God has put certain people groups in certain places for a reason. And what that means is that those who are native and indigenous to a territory have a privileged legal authority to possess the land for Christ. So if you're of a particular ethnicity, you can do evangel evangelical work in wherever you are, of course, but also it'll be more effective if you go back to your original land of your people. So my native Ojibwe teacher from boot camp wrote this. Um, All members of the current population of Earth have an earthly indigenous identity that connects them through their ancestors to the geographical location, sorry, to the geographical land of some nation or nations on Earth. This we call national identity. And it's a key part of God's plan for man to exercise effective dominion on some spot of land in the earth. So in the new paradigm, and this is bled over into the new paradigm of missionary thought, where European and American missionaries no longer envision long-term careers in the mission field. Rather, and you've probably seen this, um, the proper thing to do is to have short-term missions and, low, and equip and uh, train local pastors to do mission work in their own lands. And it's fascinating, I was at a conference in the Society for Pentecostal Studies listening to missionaries post-colonial critiques of imperialism and um, weaving concerns about racism and neocolonialism into their strategies for mission. So um, foreign aid for third wave, this is also called the third wave evangelical movement, foreign aid of the aid of an American would be about supporting, equipping, and providing capital, and they're big on entrepreneurial mentorship for local pastors and their business enterprises. Um, one, and the, uh, J.L. Williams, who you saw in this clip right here, writes in one of his pamphlets, the local nationals never had ownership of the mission or, or ministry from the very inception. At best, they only had a passive partnership. This is in like foreign, foreign rooted mission, mission uh, stations of, in uh, developing countries. But true ownership was never theirs. Therefore, when it comes to leadership in the body of Christ, the best leaders are always local leaders, people who are the native sons, the sons of the soil. In the final analysis, no foreign expatriate can ever lastingly take the place of the national. So he's, he used to be a long-term missionary, and now he's stepped back to become a short-term missionary. So following this philosophy, many missionaries now make small teams of short, take small teams of short-term missionaries to Haiti and elsewhere. You can see them in, your, in their matching t-shirts. We've all seen them uh, in matching t-shirts at the airport. Um, because in this new paradigm, the ownership of church property and ministries rightly belongs to the native sons of the soil, provided they are Christian. Um, and this, may, this nuances the transnational evangelical um, critique of being neo-colonial and American imposed. Um, so I could go on for several days <laughs> about this, but I think I'll just close with a, a more broad um, uh, reflection, which is that for Haitians, and especially the poor, uh, who comprise most of the people in Haiti, the stories of spiritual warfare may pay off in a number of ways, mediating in some symbolic way the catastrophe of Haitian modernity. In both, in evangelical services, the national stories of Haiti are retold and re-narrated uh, in light of scriptural stories. And becoming an actor in the national story for Christian redemption, or the national struggle for Christian redemption, makes it possible for Haitians to visit, 
position themselves as the legitimate people, a modern people engaged in a modern struggle. And it forces, um, it certainly forces people to choose between starkly contrasting theologies, ideologies, politics, and community formations, as well as to forge networks outside of Haiti and throughout the globe. So um, thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take reflections or questions. Thank you. Yes. Well, um, so I, I was talking about this early on modern Christianity, so of course, I think mean, you must get this question a lot. I'm just interested in the ways in which, um, uh, to, you know, one part of the story that could get told today is the connections to, of course, a very long history of spiritual warfare, the Crusades, for example, or certainly Martin Luther understanding the sort of battle with the devil is absolutely central to any understanding of Christianity. So I guess I'm just curious in the ways in which you see this as modern and distinctively modern and the ways in which you see this as a kind of ongoing part of Christianity yeah. self-understanding. Yeah, no, that's a great, and I've been struggling with this in my piece of the project on the militarization and neoliberalism, because what I, at first I thought, oh, this is so new, but then I real, then historian friends were like, well, it's not so new. It's an evilist trick. So I, yeah, it's like, we've seen this all before. But I think what is new is the following. Um, I think that perhaps, perhaps we, could, we could make an argument that Christian spiritual warfare takes not so surprisingly, takes on the military uh, vocabulary and ideology of the time that it's embedded in. So what, we're find, what I'm finding now is that the spiritual warriors are taking on um, the echoes of Vietnam, to some extent Korea, and, and Iraq, and that they are using, uh, they, they're importing into the vocabulary uh, strategies and not first of all strategies like mission small mission strikes, Delta Force team of trained killer in my email this morning. Um, probably in the Crusades they're not sending out teams of trained killers to do a mission strike, but that's very much the language of spiritual warfare now. And they're also using GIS technology, not not in not well. I don't know what they're doing when I'm not. <laughs> able to see what they're doing, but they're using it in terms of global mapping. And you know, they're, they, they think of themselves as using satellites and using global positioning and mapping out very scientifically and, and technologically the mission field and the mission project. Can, can I actually ask you, so yeah. when you said for initially you thought it was so new, what, what, from what perspective would it seem new? I, I guess maybe, since I am a historian, I, don't, I, I, I guess I'm surprised by that assumption. Well, that because it seemed new. It, would, it seemed new because the evangelical, the idea of evangelicals doing spiritual warfare is relatively new from the 80s. And the evangelicals, were, they were thought to be quite um, sequestered. The idea was to be of the world but not in it, to be a world apart, not vote, not get out and do politics, not you know, do missions certainly, but not in this kind of um, very aggressive way. So from the point of view of mainline Protestantism and from the point of view of what we thought the evangelical uh, sphere was up to, this was sort of another chapter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, most of my mental life is devoted to uh, phenomena on the 1040 window, so uh, this is gonna be a, a woefully under-informed question, but um, two, two, two questions actually. What is, um, I'm wondering if you could say a bit about the heavy Native American uh, presence mm -hmm. in the boot camp that you attended and the way in which that dovetails with the theme that those of the land will take the land, right? Um, I, I'm wondering about the tensions that might create with an evangelical base that is not mostly Native American, presumably, right? Um, and so there's that part of the question. The other, the other question that I have is, the extent to which this idea that one is inspired by the Holy Spirit as a kind of supreme commander yep. might throw a wrench into the um, isomorphy that one could observe perhaps between military structures of power and um, church structures of power, right? I mean, what do we do in the case where the Holy Spirit suddenly commands an underling, right, to revolt against a commander? Um, what do we do in that sort of situation? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, I'll take the second one first because I have the answer right at hand, which is 
there's a lot, this is a big tension that I observed in the camp. And it seemed to me from what was, be, what was going on implicitly and what was being alluded to was that in the past, there had been mission strikes during which a relatively low-ranking warrior had felt that God was talking to them in a certain way and wanted to do things differently all of a sudden. And so they structured, um, they, the emphasis on lines of authority and protocol was very, very marked. And the way they deal with this is to, to have the command structure of the mission strike resemble the army, you know, the military one. And that if you do feel that you're getting word from the Holy Spirit, you must go directly, because there's a, one of the general orders was you must report all enemy formations. Um, if you have an enemy formation to report or a revelation from spirit to report, you are to report that directly to the commanding officer. So the commanding officer can always adjudicate whether the mission will change or not. Mm -hmm. So the way, so there is an underlying tension, as there is in any case of charismatic Christianity, where the Holy Spirit can speak to all of us. Uh, this is a big problem for hierarchy and stuff. So the way they see, they seem to be using military chain of command very explicitly to resolve that. And your first was about Native oh, American native, presence yeah. in the boot camp. Well, so the Native piece was just, you know, when you're doing eth ethnographic work, you go where you have entree and you, the snowball, you go with the sm snowball method, which is you get passed on from person to person. You go where they'll let you go and where you are where they'll let you be. And twice, once I signed up for an advanced spiritual warfare seminar, only to arrive and find out that the leader, the teacher, was native. And that was very surprising to me. So I learned about his take on it, which was heavily leavened with revelation from the Holy Spirit from his Ojibwe grandmother. And then um, I met these folks who, are, who I knew were native beforehand. And because I'd taken his workshop, I felt like this would be a thread, but they're a, they're a tiny minority of the spiritual warfare community, and they're the ones who have developed the rhetoric of indigeneity mm -hmm. and authority over the land. And so I think one of the things that's interesting about the movement is that even though the leadership were, was people like uh, Peter Wagner, who's the head of theological missions at Fuller Seminary, Fuller Theological Seminary, um, the leadership has tended to be professional theologians who've been Anglo-American, it's because of the revelation of spirit, it is possible for Haitians, Brazilians, natives, to come in with further revolu revelation, to fill in the blanks. So it's the natives have, who have filled in the indigenous authority piece. And what's been really lovely to see, and which is sort of runs counter to the neo-colonial frame, which would also be possible to use, What's been lovely to see is uh, at conferences, there's been an effort to include Native people and have them take certain kinds of honorary and very honor honoring roles about starting, kicking off the thing and doing blessings, um, which is interesting in itself because they're not supposed to be Native blessings, but they're, right. they'll do Christian blessings kind of in a Native register. Right. And now, however, does this trickle into evangelicals working politically for reparations, for human rights for natives, for any number of issues that natives are still fighting? I don't think so. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this, this is all really great. And I, I want to kind of press you a little bit to position this movement in kind of theological and geographic context. And so, I mean, the. The terms evangelical, Pentecostal, charismatic, they, they're used relatively interchangeably the way that you're in. And I mean, my sense, having looked at some, some of these materials, not so much in Haiti, is that there, there certainly is this movement with evangelicals and Pentecostals in the US who are attracted to it, but there's a spectrum. And so there would be certain kind of groups, individuals who would feel comfortable with some of the theology not at all the style. Um, there are many evangelicals and even Pentecostals who would feel very uncomfortable with both the theology and the style. And I mean, and even in the reference to Peter Wagner as, as one of the leaders, and rightly so, 
I mean, he and others, they, they learned a lot of what they then promulgated from two-thirds world um, groups. And, and so I, I don't know if this is so much an American export as kind of a re-export of an import, yeah. um, which may have some bearing on questions of agency of the Haitian evangel. And I think kind of using the evangelical Pentecostal slash works better in countries outside the US than it often does in the US. So I mean, it because part of, there's more agency because it's not necessarily just coming from the US. And part of the appeal, I suspect, is that there is more of an overlap with worldviews that are traditional. And so it's not the enlightenment paradigm that you have to break through, but there's a lot of common assumptions, actually. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there so as not to be long-winded, but I would just, yeah, I would love to hear some reflections. No, you're, you're absolutely right. You obviously know what you're talking about. It's, it, there's a, I have a whole section where I try to explain and parse out what I'm talking about, and I find it's easier to gloss it crudely and incorrectly for um, you know, purposes of trying to move into the material. But I'm thinking of the spiritual warfare movement as a network, mm -hmm. and it's a network that crosses people who would identify as variously evangelical, Pentecostal, charismatic, spirit-filled, even into some mainline Protestant mm -hmm. churches, it's possible that it's crossing into Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And um, they, what I've noticed is that the, people do a really good job not to pick at the differences in both theology, style, and kind of effective affinities or disaffinities when they're getting together in these conferences. They, they smooth everything over. They're not going to worry about these things because these things are a big deal. These theological questions are a really big deal. So it's an interesting, um, so it's a, it's a network and I think people go, come in and out of it in the US. You know, churches have been exposed to it and rejected it or accepted it or maybe the church rejected it but there's a little prayer cell that like keeps going on the side that maybe not everybody else knows about. Um, and and um, so I think you're absolutely right. And in, in the book, I have to work to make that clear. Also, with regard to the re-import, re-export, I like that a lot. And I hope maybe you wouldn't let me mind, let me mind if I uh, appropriate, re-export your uh, re-export. <laughs> because um, it's Louise Bush, right, the Argentinian, who's the real one who brings it to the Lausanne, um, Eventual conference and puts it on the table, and he's already figured out a lot of what he wants to do. And it, so I think you're right. It's Charles Kraft and, and um, Wagner at Fuller. They're the ones that sort of stamp it with approval and re-export it, both for the theological world in English and for the world that's listening to American missionaries. Um, and. I find that they aren't worried, unlike us, we're worried about citing and, you know, citational practices, and they just do not worry about that. They will lift each other's prose and plop it into their own and not cite it, and it's all about the advancing the kingdom of God, which is very sweet, but it's not what we do, so I'm always surprised to see, um, which it makes it a little hard to trace, like, whose thought is this? But I, but I thank you for, for um, Noting that and for giving me that vocabulary of like the ex the re-export of an import, um, that's really helpful. Professor Selka. Yes. Um, could you say a little bit more about? Um, <clears throat> so you mentioned that there, are, are there when you did the spiritual warfare training that there was uh, training about how to discern supernatural signs and so on. Um, so uh, we've talked about this in other venues, but. Um, to what extent are those signs kind of derived from local local traditions? And, and what I'm kind of getting at is the way that this sort of brand of uh, spiritual warfare, one of the things, that maybe it isn't distinctive about it, but it is certainly really kind of notable about it, is the way in which it, it draws upon local indigenous religions um, in its kind of explanation and sort of language. Um, so what to what extent in, in Haiti uh, do you have you know sort of the there was a quote in one of the um, one of the clips where the pastor was bragging about having had like seven voodoo priests um, yeah. convert 
So, I mean, do they supply inside information that then the spiritual warriors can use to kind of discern? Totally. Okay. Um, it's like the A, well, people used to joke back when AA was first kind of coming out of the closet as being something you could admit to having gone to, that, um, you know, the worst alcoholics are the ones who are now the most pious Alcoholics Anonymous advocates. So it's, uh, you know, I, my bottom was so low that, that the program has done so much for me. Uh, there are sorcerers who have made a second career out of um, radio and personal appearances where they explain how many people they killed through sorcery, how many horrific deeds they did. And now, because I was so demonic, but now I'm saved, you know, now it's great the glory of God through. So through the exaggerated, exaggerated uh, recounting of past sin is God's glory even greater. And so it's very tempting to use those folks as sources, but it's also very problematic. Mm -hmm. But what it does reveal is that there is a, a real, as we talked about earlier, an intertwining, to use actually your vocabulary about the Brazil case, there's a way in which these are two separate religious spheres, voodoo and evangelicalism, and there's a way in which they're, inter they're actually intertwined and they're starting to co-construct one another. And so some of the people in the evangelical world do have a great knowledge of the traditional world. And in fact, I befriended later in my field stint last year a young pastor, beautiful young brother who, um, in Frere Miso, Brother Miso, and his expertise, because he knows Voodoo so well, is he's created a whole series of divorce rituals uh, for if you've married a spirit, you can now go to him and he will help you divorce the spirit. And he, well, he knows how to do it because he grew up in Voodoo. And um, it's a brilliant, ingenious little employment niche, not to mention healing niche, a spiritual niche. I mean, it's absolutely brilliant. And does anyone know Catholicism really well? They, he calls this a cure d'âme, like a healing of the soul, cure d'âme, which is apparently a Catholic rite. Does anybody know about this? But it's not the same as in a Catholic, so I have, to, I have to work on that a little bit more. Yes? Yeah, thank you very much for a really beautiful presentation. Um, I have two questions that are very different. So the first one is, might there be something interesting to say about the money behind this movement and where it's going? And the second is, um, could you speak a little bit more about the um, charismatic performance that goes into this? Um, the presentation, the music, for example, um, and what you might be seeing. Yeah. Um, the money part really varies depending on the church. And the church that I s settled into with the most comfort and admiration in Haiti was run, I met them when they were refugees on a, in a tent camp on a soccer field after the earthquake. And um, their poor, sl I mean, I don't like, I want to say slum dwellers, but that's such an awful phrase. But they're poor folk. And, um, oh boy, that's a whole, the, what, the way they deal with money is actually fascinating. To put a very long story short, they were offered um, rebuilding help by humanitarian and sort of paid uh, pr private sector construction crews. And they figured out, based on the fact that the crews kept offering lower and lower prices, they figured out this was not really a form of help. If you could have offered me a low price at first, why do you wait three weeks and bargain me down? So, they, so God told the pastor to everyone get up, take a week off from whatever else you're doing, which wasn't actually much. We're going we're gonna to clear the rubble and rebuild the church ourselves. So they would take weeks throughout the next period of time and all pool their money, pool their resources, and um, what is it called, metaphor, using the, it's literally the strong hand of community. They, are, they have very, very little money, and they seem to really collectively operate in a very, very cooperative way. However, there's a mega church now called Shalom, which is all about um, you know, typical prosperity gospel, receiving envelopes of tithes and one-upping each other on your envelope and how much can you pledge and you better come back next week with that amount. And if you come back with that amount, Jesus will bless you even more and you'll get a visa to the United States. And it's very crass. And it, uh, my guess is that there will eventually be a corruption investigation. Although Shalom, they're coming to Boston 
this coming weekend. And I'm going to try to catch up with them there, but I'm not sure if I will. So the money varies, but it is um, the money is a big deal in these churches because it circulates very openly in the collection basket, and often there is um, the prosperity gospel can enter in, although it doesn't always in Haiti. So that's to make a very long answer a little shorter. You had a question over here. As, as a summoner attuned to a time past, um, I wonder about the history of Joe White and the choice to spell can camps for kids. Is he a, a Wilcox Klein member? Oh, God. <laughs> that is, that's a sort of I'll go lie down. <laughs> Wait, this choice to spell mm -hmm. Kennecook camps was the phrase that uh, was his address. And the camp part with the K. Kennecook has two Ks in it. Huh. Right. Crispy uh, uh, Green Donuts was coding exactly that way. <laughs> I did not know. So there's a secret sign of the K being a sign, a, an index it's of It's widely used in the South, even now. And it, it um, was, uh, it was a code in the 50s, 60s. That is so horrific, helpful, and fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> in that order, in any order. Um, I would be horrified, we would all be horrified if Joe White were in any way related to the Klan. I'm going to stab, I don't know, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find out. I don't know, you'll tell me how I find out, though. Because, I mean, my people are from North, my father's people are from North Carolina. And, uh, I don't know, and, and North Carolina is where J.L. Williams' mission center is. He's the bigger one who's talking about the blood pack. I did go to that mission center. The, it's the world headquarters, but it's like a small building, a strip mall. But, um, but I learned at that, and I was, and I was, um, you know, open to what am I gonna find? Am I gonna find Southern white racists? Am I gonna find not Southern white racists? Um, Joe um, J. L. Williams, one of his pr points of pride, and he had photos on the wall, is that in the '60s, he um, was uh, his the church where he was had the first, if I'm not mistaken, or the first in its area, interracial gospel music. Uh, Choir. And he seemed to be, one of his narratives of his mission is that it's been long interracial for a very long time. He had a mural of um, the Last Supper at which every single disciple was a person of color. There was like Asian, brown, black, African um, people at, in the mural. So I was kind of impressed at the attention to anti-racism or, and or diversity. So I would be horrified and surprised if white is a clan is related to the clan, but it's anything's possible. It's just such a surprise it's done. Yeah, I'll have to definitely look at that. It, how would I look how would I figure that out? I would call the southern population. Okay, yeah. So do you think they would be tracking the likes? Probably not. Oh, isn't it a little bit like the debate about the um Carol Mockingbird and um, hotel watchman. I mean, it's never, there's not some key, like, oh, then now we know the racists. Like, it's a complicated, <laughs> right. as you show, and as those dynamics in the, even in any, any of these, any of these scenarios, race, so racial dynamics are quite complicated. So, yeah, we're, all, we're all in a sense complicated. I, I guess I'm just, um, I, 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 of course, coding is an interesting thing to track, but it's not I, I'm curious whether you imagine that there would be sort of some like in a secret room people would actually tell their real identity as opposed to the sort of more difficult, complicated thing, which is we're all in some way caught up in a racist society, and that, that certainly is going to be influencing and affecting all the actions of all, all, all of our actions and the people you study. Yeah, yeah. No, no you're absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, it would be a starker matter. If only it were so simple, right, that we could yeah. find them in some room somewhere. Yeah. Um, can you say a little bit more about the kind of sophisticated narratives that they're using to self-describe? It seems that 
Um, I mean, they're really advanced and intellectually sophisticated. And I wonder, if, you know, I think of earlier efforts at evangelical missions. Often there was an effort to kind of give a scientific veneer or a verification. Is there a way in which the kind of rhetoric of the, the academy is somehow affecting the way these folks see their kind of veneer or polish of authenticity or scientific or intellectual yeah. rigor or something? Yeah, I, I saw this in several ways that, that honestly did surprise me. At a Pentecostal conference, I heard people discussing anti uh, post-colonial theory and, and Pentecostal theology together. And I, I was new to Pentecostal thought, so that surprised me. And um, also a concern and, a, and an extended conversation about how to avoid neo-colonialism, how to avoid being neo-colonialist, and how to cut off from practices in the past that they were now looking back and seeing their forebears had been colonialist. How are we not going to be this way? And um, I even, one guy was drawing on Derrida for his talk at this conference. I was like, wow, that may show more about my, you know, north, northern blue state snobbery, intellectual snobbery, that I was surprised. But I'll just tell you that that's who they're drawing on, some of them. And um, it, on the other side of the fence, too, some of the people in the ethnographic field were drawing on ideas about DNA and ideas, certainly, well, certainly GIS mapping. So they're, um, they, they imported the idea of DNA to, to come up with the idea of spiritual DNA. So if, you're, if your forebears were Indian killers or slave traders, you bear that iniquity in your spiritual DNA. And on the other hand, if, or simultaneously, if your people were Christian for many generations, that would bode well for your spiritual DNA you would have a life that was freer of demonic influence. But it would be marred even if they were Christian, if, you're, if your ancestors were slave traders, let's say. So there is a movement, a sub-movement of this um, movement interested in uh, um, familial repentance, ancestral repentance. And they'll stage um, sort of very touching but complicated and problematic rituals where um, uh, an Anglo settler, an Anglo person who is standing in for settlers in, the, in New England, for example, one, one that I was near, was asking forgiveness and repenting before a Native apostle, a Native American apostle. And the Native person gave forgiveness to the Anglo person who was on their knees. And so, and they've done, the promise keepers did this too, right? The promise keepers had um, mass kind of whites would repent to black Americans for sins of racism. So that's, um, they're using DNA, spiritual DNA, to get at these questions of why are we still being affected by our ancestors' actions. So I think. Um, yeah, we're drawing to a close here. I uh, thank everybody for, for coming and uh, for spending lovely time with uh, Professor McAllister. And uh, so thank you once again. And uh, I don't know what else to say except for good night. <laughs>